Well, Jesus, I thank you that you are trustworthy, that we can indeed trust you. And even when life is uncertain and at times confusing, and even when there are challenges that lie before us, and God, we struggle sometimes with fully trusting you, I thank you for your faithfulness. And I pray that you would help us to understand more today <clears throat> just how trustworthy you are, and help us, God, to be people who are willing to follow you in every area of our lives in obedience out of love and appreciation for all that you have done for us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. <clears throat> so the year was 1776. And on Thursday, July the 4th, the Continental Congress approved and adopted the final text of the Declaration of Independence. Approximately one month later, I actually never knew this, so I was researching this, but approximately one month later on August the 2nd is when it was actually signed. And it was signed by 56 men who gathered together in, at Independence Hall in Philadelphia to sign that famous document. And from henceforth then, it was no longer the 13 colonies of England, but n it's now the United States of America. But you see, signing that document was most certainly not an impulsive, uh, spur-of-the-moment decision that these men made. They were committing themselves to each other. They were committing themselves to this new nation that they were establishing. And they did that knowing full well that it might cost them. It might cost them dearly. In fact, I want you to listen to this last sentence of the Declaration of Independence. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. I tell you, that was courage. And that took real commitment, didn't it? When they put their names on that document, they were declaring to England that they were indeed acknowledging, proclaiming their independence, and they realized it may even cost them their lives. And the reason I tell you all of that, not just a history lesson, but it's because of the fact that it reminded me so much of what we are studying here in the book of Nehemiah. I'm going to ask you to turn to Nehemiah chapter 9 as we continue our journey through this book, but what happened in 1776 in Philadelphia so similar to what we're going to see here because we talked about this last week right after the walls had of Jerusalem had been reconstructed now this the the shift is made towards the spiritual development of this city of this nation as these people had returned from exile and as we saw last week after the reading of the word of god the people realized they learned two absolute truths if they didn't already know them first of all they they learned that god is a really good and a really great god secondly they learned indeed that they are a sinful people just as we are and the thing about it, what's extraordinary about these people here, though, in Jerusalem is they did not just talk about that. Remember, we went through that whole lengthy prayer in chapter 9. It's the longest prayer in all of Scripture. But they didn't just leave it there. They then did something very significant about it. I want you to just look at with Nehemiah chapter 9. Go to the end of the chapter. Let me read verse 38 and follow along as I do that. After their prayer... Acknowledging God's goodness, his greatness, and their sinfulness. Verse 38, because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. Wow. They put it down. They were making a commitment. We're going to see what they committed to here in a few moments. But they made a commitment and they were so serious about it that they wrote their names down to do that. Now the next 27 verses of chapter 10 here, they give the names of 84 men who in, did indeed commit themselves to following God and were so serious about their commitment that they signed on this document. 
Now, I am not going to read all of those 84 names. I know you guys are so bummed, but you can read those um, after the service. You can read them after <laughs> the service, not during. But, but I want you to see as we go through this, these men, just like the signers of our Declaration of Independence, these men put themselves out there because they did not take this lightly. As leaders, they wanted to follow God as well as they also wanted them to set an example to all of the rest of the people of Judea. Specifically, now they're in the, the city of Jerusalem, but this was going beyond that. And so what they did by signing their names is they made themselves accountable to everyone else about what they were committing to do. And you see, there were really four areas of promises that they made. Four things that they declared that they would do. And one is kind of a general overarching uh, theme of it, but then there are three specific more focused areas. I want us just to kind of quickly go through that and see these four things that these men promised and committed themselves to do. Number one was to honor God with a commitment to obedience. I want to pick up reading now in verse 28 of chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 28. I'm going to ask you to follow along as I read two verses there. The rest of the people, in other words, all those who were not the 84 who signed, verses 1 through 27, the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, and the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, and all who have knowledge and understanding join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and to do all the commandments of the Lord our Lord and his rules and his statutes. So the first thing here is they are making this commitment. You can see there is said right from the text to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our Lord and his rules and his statutes. Now, I love to do word studies. Praise God, I'm not alone in that. There's a few of you that I know love word studies. But I wanted to be clear on this. Because sometimes we use the, the word all in very uh, general ways, and it doesn't really mean all. It just kind of means a lot and all this stuff. So I wanted to, do, to know what they were saying here because they committed to doing all the commandments of the Lord. And so the word study on that word all, I thought that was very interesting. What that word all means is all. Ha! You guys are like, yeah, Rick, um, I kind of could have told you that. But it means all, it means everything. It means the whole. So can I just say this? There is not a lot of wiggle room there, right? They're being very clear. They are pledging themselves, signing on this document that we are committing to observe and to follow all, not just the ones we think are good, all. Not just the ones that we kind of like doing, all the commandments of God. And notice they were so serious about it that they were even willing to accept a curse and punishment if they failed to keep their promises to God. That's kind of an Old Testament thing. You go through the books, you'll see a lot of times there was like, God said that, that if you keep my word and obey, there will be blessings upon you. If you disobey, there will be uh, curses upon you, punishment upon you. They are saying here, we are willing even to take the curse, the punishment, if we fail to stay true to this commitment we are making. That was a serious commitment, right? You can see that. Second thing that they committed to, their promise, was to honor God in their marriages. Now look at verse 30 with me. We will not give our daughters to the people of the land or take their daughters for our sons. You see, this was not about racial or ethnic or cultural prejudice. That had nothing to do with it. This was about religious purity. We talked about this last week. These people, these other, these foreigners, these people from other lands, they are talking about people who did not follow God. They did not follow after Yahweh. And so this is all about this religious purity. They were not going to allow themselves, Jewish people, to marry followers of false gods. The, the New Living Translation, I think, helps us to even understand this a little better. This is what, how it translates this verse. We promise not to let our daughters marry the pagan people of the land 
and not to let our sons marry their daughters. They were serious about spiritual purity, even in their marriages. Third thing that they were committing themselves to do was to honor God every Sabbath day and every Sabbath year. Verse 31. And if the peoples of the land bring in the goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on, any, or on a holy day. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. Okay, the fourth commandment. You guys know this. The fourth commandment from Exodus 20 of the Ten Commandments says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. The problem is, that we see here, is that the pagan people, the ones who were not following God, did not believe in him and worship him, they were actually coming into the city of Jerusalem because they couldn't have cared less about that fourth commandment. That meant nothing to them. So what they would do is they'd bring their goods and they would bring their crops right into the city on the Sabbath day to sell. Now we can kind of make an assumption here. The fact that they brought them into the city to sell tells us that the people had been buying them. But all of a sudden the people are saying, no more. We will not even buy those things that they bring into the city to sell on that day. And then also, the end of that verse, it starts talking about the seventh year. Every seventh year, God had set this up when they came into the land of Israel. Every seventh year was to be a Sabbath year, which meant that the people were not to plant or harvest crops at all that year. They were to just simply let the land be dormant for those 12 months, Sadly, though, is if you read the Old Testament, you understand that through the entire history of the nation of Israel, from the time that they entered the promised land with Joshua leading them after Moses died, right up through their captivity uh, by, from Babylon in 586 B.C., throughout that entire time, never once did they honor God by following the Sabbath year. Think about the commitment that these people now are making. They're saying for a thousand years, our people have not followed God's commandment to do that, but no longer. We are committing ourselves to doing exactly what God says that we should do. We are going to observe the Sabbath year. The fourth thing that they were committing to doing was to honor God with their finances. A little longer passage to read, but we're going to work our way through it. Verse 32, follow along as we read through 39. We also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. Let me just pause. That's a temple tax that they were initiating here. Okay, verse 33. For the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. We, the priests, the Levites, and the people have likewise cast lots for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God according to our Father's houses at times appointed year by year to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all the fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord. Also to bring to the house of God to the priests who minister in the house of our God the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks, and to bring the first of our dough and our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine and the oil, to the priest, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring to the Levites the tithes from our ground. For it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our towns where we labor. And the priests, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes, and the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes, a tithe is literally a tenth, so this is bring up a tenth of the tenth to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers. We will not neglect the house of our God. Each person pledged several things financially here. They were to pay the yearly temple tax. They were to be involved in bringing wood into the temple. And that was done. They cast lots to see who would 
who would do that and when. They also committed themselves to give of the first fruits of the harvest, not the leftovers, the first fruits, and even being willing to dedicate their firstborn sons and even their animals for service to God. And the focus of their tithes and offerings here in these verses was the temple. That was the central place where they gathered together to be able to worship God. And in fact, <clears throat> the phrase, the house of our God, is used no less than eight times in those verses we just read, 32 through 39. So I tell you again, these are remarkable people. As they heard the word of God read to them, and they realized where they had failed, they committed themselves to obedience. They didn't make excuses for the past failures. They didn't try to rationalize why it might not be convenient to obey some of those laws at that point in time. They didn't delay. They drew up a document and they signed it, pledging themselves to follow after God in all of those areas. So I tell you, these were remarkable people. But of course we go through this and we say, well, what, what can we learn from this? What, what can we take away from this passage that will help us become more faithful followers of Jesus Christ? Because it's not like we're going to reinstitute all of the Old Testament laws. We're not going to do that. But I think that there's some, some very practical things that you and I need to learn and to understand and to take away from this passage that will help us greatly. So there's really three application points that I want to give you, and I think that they come right here from the text. Number one is this. Be serious about commit obedience to God. Let's be honest. We can never be good enough to earn our salvation. I'm sorry, did, did I say never? Good, because I meant never! <laughs> we can never be good enough. Our salvation is based solely in Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross for us. He did all of the work necessary for our salvation. He did all of the work necessary to pay the penalty for the sins that we deserve by dying on the cross in our place and then rising from the grave to conquer sin and death forever. The only part, get this clearly, please get this clearly, the only part you and I have in salvation is just simply accepting the free gift that God offers to us. That's it. <laughs> it's like, well, there's got to be something more I can do. There's not. You can't do anything. Jesus did it all. However, even though Jesus did it all, even though there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation, that does not mean that obedience is not important to God. How can, how can we possibly think that after what Jesus did for our sins, dying, I mean for us, dying on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, how can we possibly think that it doesn't matter whether or not we sin? Sin cost him his life. And yet sometimes we take it so casually. Jesus himself said that if we love him, we will keep his commandments. Paul, the Apostle Paul, just, just in one chapter, in Romans chapter 6, in verse 12, he says this. He says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Verse 13, do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Verse 14, for sin will have no dominion over you. I'm telling you, how we live is really important. We don't follow God's commandments to earn salvation. <laughs> Talked about that. There's nothing we can do. But once we are saved, we need to follow God's commandments. D.L. Moody, the great 19th century uh, evangelist, put it this way. I thought it was so well stated. He said, a man ought to live so that everybody knows he is a Christian. And most of all, his family ought to know thought that was important because, see, sometimes we can play the game pretty well. We can put up the walls. We can put, wear the mask. We can pretend that we're doing really well. People don't know us. Our families know us. <coughs> Man, that can be kind of scary, can't it? But they know us. We need to live in such a way that everybody knows that we are a Christian. Live so that people can see Jesus in you. 
Be serious about your obedience to God and stop thinking that it's no big deal whether you sin or not. I'm here to tell you it is a big deal. You will never lose your salvation. But it is a big deal. God hates sin. We need to be serious about obedience to him. Second thing that I think for us to learn from this passage is to teach your children the importance of Christian marriage. <clears throat> I really want to be delicate here. And I hope that you know me well enough to know that my intent is not to hurt any of you or to make you feel bad. But the New Testament is very clear that a believer should not marry a non-believer. Now, now if they do, now if they do, the moment that, that ring goes on their finger and that they say, I do, I tell you, then you need to be fully committed to that person you just pledged your life to. Fully committed for the rest of your life, even if they are not a follower of Jesus. But oh, what heartache many people have endured because they disobeyed God's command and they married someone who wasn't a Christian. What spiritual difficulties they have faced throughout their life because their mate refused to follow after Jesus Christ. So I say to you, if you are not married, please, please hear me clearly on this. God's way is always the best way and so do not allow yourself to even begin a relationship with an unbeliever. Don't do it. So many people think, well, I can control it. Once it gets too serious, I'm going to break it off. You are lying to yourself. You forget the power of your emotions. So I tell you, don't even start dating someone who is not a follower of Christ. And parents... Teach your children that. Teach them that if someone asks them out on a date, that they won't even accept unless they find out that that person is a growing, committed follower of Jesus Christ. Teach your children how it is important for them not to ask someone out unless they know that that person is saved. And dads, Especially from the time that your daughter can walk. Raise her to know that any prospective suitor, anyone who wants to date her, will need to talk to you first. Don't wait until she's 18 and said, hey, I've just got a new rule I want to throw out here for you, okay? Um, anybody wants to date you, they need to come and see me first. Don't do it. She'll, re she'll reject that. But I'm telling you, from the time that they can start to walk, teach them that that's what you expect out of them. And it's not because you're trying to be mean. It's not because you're trying to be harsh. It's because you want to protect her. And if someone asks to date your daughter and he comes and he talks with you, I think the first question you need to ask is, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? And if he says yes, then say, tell me about that. Because sometimes they just know how to play the game and say, well, I know I'm supposed to say yes to this. But I tell you, if he comes and he wants to date your daughter and you find out he is not a Christian, say no. I know that can be hard. Say no. I am sorry, but you cannot date my daughter because she believes in Jesus Christ. She is a follower of him and it is so important. I love her too much to let her get involved with someone who does not accept, has not accepted Jesus Christ. I know that sounds harsh. I know that that can be hard. But I tell you, you love your daughter too much to let her possibly face a lifetime of heartache because she chooses to marry someone who is not a follower of Christ. These people in Nehemiah were serious about it. I'm not going to ask you to sign a document, but I'm telling you, you need to be serious about that too. The third thing that I think we can learn for ourselves from this passage is to trust God with your time, your service, and your money. Now, maybe some of you are thinking, hey, wait a, wait a minute here, Rick. How does trust have anything to do with the Sabbath day and Sabbath year and all those offerings for the temple? And besides, those were Jewish things that the 
people did back then, but they don't really affect us today. And there's, there's a lot of that I would agree with in that statement. But I want you to understand something. This is not about whether you should do something on... We don't even observe the Sabbath day, to be honest. This is Sunday, which is Resurrection Day. <laughs> Sabbath was Saturday. All right, from the early church, right after the resurrection, they began worshiping Jesus Christ on Sunday. So Sabbath day, you can have your own personal views. I'm not going to wade, wade into that and all of that. But I want you to understand something here. Sabbath day observance, even the way it was set up in the Old Testament, was much less about doing work and much more about trusting God to meet their needs by only working six days and focusing on worshiping him on the seventh day. It was about trust. It wasn't about whether you should walk a certain distance or if you took an extra step too much, it was like, oh, you just sinned. That's terrible. No, it was about trusting God to say, six days, I will work, and I will work hard, but on that seventh day, I am going to worship you. Now, now in our culture, a lot of people have jobs. They have to work on Sunday. That's not the thing. Again, I'm not even talking about that. I'm not talking about work. I'm talking about trust. And the seventh, excuse me, the Sabbath year thing, it was the same, same idea. It was about trusting God. Now, I tell you, it had to be hard. This was an agricultural uh, society that they lived in here. It had to be hard not to till and to plant and to, and to then uh, harvest your crops that year. It had to be hard to just let your land sit dormant for a year. And I would suggest that's probably why the Jews failed to ever honor God by doing the Sabbath year rest. But basically what God was saying was, trust me and I will provide. Now, don't go into your boss tomorrow and say, you know what, um, I'm declaring a Sabbath year's rest. I, I want the year off, full pay. I'm thinking he, yeah, don't go there, okay? That won't work. Again, this isn't about us keeping that Old Testament Jewish law. This is about trusting God. And what about all the offerings to God? Uh, were, the, were the Jews here? They committed all of this. They committed their tithes. Were they so flush with money that they had plenty left over and so they could give it to God? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say no to that. Because if you remember back in Nehemiah 5, when we looked at it there, the people themselves, they were even selling their children into slavery just so that they could pay some of their bills. So I'm telling you, these people were hard up. They did not have a lot of extra money. They were struggling financially. And yet, they committed to God, it says, to give him the first fruits of their crops. That meant giving to God first and then living off the rest. A tithe is literally a tenth. And notice it says that they gave tithes of all that they had. All that they had. Now, <clears throat> did you know that the average American evangelical Christian gives approximately 3% of their income to charity? That's what the statistics tell us. 3%. Now, I know that even as I say that, some people are going to say, well, hey, a whole tithe thing, that's an Old Testament thing. The New Testament doesn't tell us that we have to give a tithe. And I would agree with that. But I will tell you there is much in the New Testament about giving. It says to give willingly. It says to give joyfully. It says to give consistently. And it says to even give sacrificially. So while I'm not hung up on 10%, don't come later and try and debate that with me. I'm not talking about 10%. I am saying, though, I think 3% is a little sad. So let, let's just kind of put it in a way that maybe we can visualize. I, I love um, pretty much any and all candies, but I'm pretty sure, I've done extensive research on this, the best candy bar out there is a Snickers. It's just the best. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I have some support. So let's say, let's say that you just gave me 10 Snickers candy bars. Needs to say I'm pretty excited, I'm pretty thrilled. I've got 10 of these things. Woohoo! And I want to thank you for that. And if any of you decide afterwards you want to try to follow through on this and make that a personal application to give me 10 Snicker bars, I will accept them. From every one of you, I would accept them. But let's say now, oh, I'm just cherishing these things. I'm loving this so much. And all of a sudden you say, by the way, <laughs> I forgot, man, I, I didn't get a chance to eat any breakfast today and the cookies were all gone in the foyer and all this stuff. And I got to tell you, I'm, Rick, I'm... 
I'm kind of hungry. Can I, I know I just gave you those 10 and they're for you, but can I just have one, can I just have one Snickers? I'm like, uh, uh, excuse me? Uh, what? You want one of mine? Um, but if I give you one of mine, then I'm going to have, I'm going to only have nine? <laughs> See, I'm pretty good on math, right? So, but if I give you one, I'm going to only have nine. And so I kind of think that you're asking an awful lot of me. So let me just ask you, how would you feel? Think about it seriously. How would you feel? I suspect that you would feel a little bit put off. Maybe you would be hurt a little bit by that. I think that you would certainly feel like I had just taken advantage of you. Um, certainly a little surprised by my, if I can call it, selfishness. But you see, what, how would you feel though if I said, wait, wait, <laughs> I don't want to take them all. Come on, you gave me 10. So I have, I'll tell you what. Here, okay. I'm going to take this one here. And, um, wait, wait, okay. I'm gonna <laughs> oh, wait, okay, I'm sorry. Here you go. <laughs> it's about a, a third of a bar. A third of a tenth. Don't you think that's kind of selfish of me? Honestly, in that situation, wouldn't it be? You're scared to answer yes because you don't know where I'm going with this, right? <laughs> it is. I'll answer that question since you guys aren't willing to. But it is. It's horribly selfish of me. Now, I just wonder if that's a little bit what we do to God. If every good and perfect gift is from God, and it is, which includes even our jobs and our ability then to make money, and then we are not even willing to give him a decent offering back to him, those are mine for later, so don't come up there and grab those, okay? <coughs> yeah, you can have the one that's a little bit left, but. But if we're not even willing to give God a decent offering back, I think that it shows one of two things. Either we're kind of selfish with our money, or we don't trust God enough to do it his way. I want you to turn with me. Look, turn quickly to the last book of the Old Testament. The last book of the Old Testament. Malachi. The book of Malachi. Now, it's interesting. Malachi was written. It's the last book that's written. Not only in our Old Testament. It's the last book that was written chronologically that's in the Old Testament here. It's only about 50 years or so later than the time of Nehemiah when the people pledged to give God all of these tithes and offerings, right? I want you to go to chapter 3 of Malachi. I want you to go down to verse 8. Let me just read this to you. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. This is God speaking. Yet you are robbing me. But you say, well, how, how have we robbed you? God's answer in your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Get this. Oh, man, verse 10. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby, this is God, get this, this is God saying this, thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is more, no more need. God says, test me. I'm saying if you give back to me what I expect you to give, I am going to bless you. And I don't want, again, I want to be sensitive to this. I understand. Some of us have gotten ourselves financially in situations that are just not good. But I hear way too often people say, well, I can't give anything because I don't have any money left over. The Jews here in Nehemiah, they gave the first fruits. 
I don't preach on tithing much. And if you guys are visitors, you're like, yeah, I'll bet they tr- preach on this all the time. No, I think this is the second time in 15 and a half years I've ever preached on tithing. But I believe in it. And I'm not talking the 10%, but I'm telling you this. God says, not Rick, God says, test me. Give to me first and see if I don't open the floodgates of heaven. This is not, a, I'm not saying this is a financial investment a strategy, but I am telling you this. God will meet your needs. He will. And the, if you say, well, you know, I just don't have much left over, then I would say redo your budget. Figure it out. But this is the thing. Give to God first. You really need to. That's what scripture says. Give to God first. You see, the difference between selfishness and trust is that selfishness says, I'm not going to drag those all out again, but this is mine. This is all mine. And here, maybe you can have a little bit of leftover bite of this one. That's what selfishness says. Trust says this, God, it is all yours, and so I give a tenth of it back to you. And I know that you will provide not only for my needs, but you will literally open the windows of heaven and pour down your blessings upon me. Do you understand that even giving is about trust? Do you understand about living your life the way that you obey God is about trust? Do you understand that marriage is about trust? That you marry someone who loves God because you are trusting that God is going to bring the right person into your life? So if you're single, trust God. Do it his way. If you're not giving, and this is not a plea to give for the church to raise its finances, this is a plea for you to trust God. Start giving your first fruits to God. Start living that way. Trust God. Every single area of your lives. And I tell you, that's what I want. I want my life to be about trust. I want my time to God to be about trusting Him. I want my service to Him to be about trusting Him. I want my money to be about trusting God. I want to be serious about obedience to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I don't want to take it for granted that just because I'm saved I can sin any way I want. I want to please Him. I most definitely want, well, not, not, for, not for my kids since they're all married, but I tell you, for my grandkids... I want them to understand the importance of dating and marrying God's way. I want to trust God in every area of my life. And I truly believe that you do too. So I'm telling you, we're not going to sign on a dotted line. We're not going to sign a contract. But I say this to you. We can trust God. He has proven himself faithful over and over and over again. So trust him. He is trustworthy. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the truth of that. I know that some of these truths are hard to deal with. And I know that even as I say them, it is so easy to come up with excuses and reasons as to why this might not work for me. God, I pray that you would take all of those excuses away. I pray that you would help every single one of us talk clearly and directly to you and to pledge to you that we will trust you in every area of our lives. And then God, give us the strength, give us the ability, give us the faith to do it so that we can be people of faith who trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.